Fans, we are live on the HannibalTV.com with another edition of the Great North Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jack Kilby, Executive Vice President of Great North Wrestling. And tonight we have on a man that I've been really looking forward to uh, in terms of this interview as a, as a hardcore original ECW fan. The man behind much of that iconic music from the original Extreme Championship Wrestling, Mr. Harry Slash. Harry, how are you tonight? Hey, I'm never going to top that intro, so we might as well just cut it now. <laughs> well, we, we've got a ton of uh, material to to cover, so I guess I guess it, it's it's a, a logical starting point to ask you in in what inspired you to make the the music that you did or could you walk us through the process of how you became involved with ECW? Well, I got to go back a few years. Um, I was a club promoter in New York in the early 90s. And on one fateful Tuesday night, instead of going to a club called Spodiotes, I went to a club called China Club, where I met some dude named Paul while waiting online to use the bathroom. And I became friends with some guy from the club scene named Paul that I saw a few days later at the limelight. The next thing I know, I'm hanging out with some guy named Paul, and I do not know what he does for a living because I wasn't watching wrestling. At some point over the next few years, I become good friends with Paul, but I I never asked what he did for a living, and because of the way others in the club world treated him, I thought he was either a, a drug dealer, a pornographer, or maybe a mafia capo. I didn't know. And then I found out what he did for a living, and it turns out he was a little bit of all those things. He was a little <laughs> bit of a drug dealer, a little bit of a pornographer, a little bit of a mafia capo, a.k.a. a performer in pro wrestling. And I didn't hold it against him. And our friendship, he, you know, I, I saw his show at the Manhattan Center uh, that he did with Jim Crockett Jr., World Wrestling Network. And I only knew two people on the entire show, Terry Funk and I think it was Road Warrior Hawk. But I just went to support my friend. Little did I know that I would be getting back into wrestling about two years after that. And it started with me helping Paul out during the week before the shows. It, it, originally, at first, I avoided going to any ECW shows when he would invite me. I would use the excuse that my old Bronco would never make it to Philadelphia. And one Thursday or Friday, he called me up and he wanted me to go to his show the next day. And I'm like, dude, my car will never make it to Philly. He then says to me on the phone, the show is on Queens Boulevard, 10 minutes from your house. If your car won't make it to Queens Boulevard, I'll send a taxi to pick you up. Still not wanting to watch wrestling because the last time I saw it, some guy was wearing a turkey costume and that just was not my cup of tea. You know, for me, wrestling ended when Bruno permed his hair, but I wanted mm -hmm. to make an appearance at my friend's show. I went to support him the way I would support like a local band. And I showed up at 1045 right before the show ended. Um, time went on, I finally saw a show from the very beginning, you know, a few months after that, when I realized this wasn't the guy dressed like a turkey and a plumber and, you know, all the cartoony stuff that, that completely turned me off to pro wrestling um, a decade or so earlier. And I'm like, this is insane. It's like a giant mosh pit and the audience all look like they could have been at like CBGB's or at a Murphy's Law show or something like that. So I'm like, this is different. I can get into this. I, I, I could get into this type of wrestling. I have, had no idea who anybody was. I didn't know what a Taz was or Harry Saturn, nobody on those first few shows. And eventually it came to the point where I ended up somehow being drafted to, to work production and backstage stuff. And then along came 97 after about a year or so of that stuff that Paul needed music for the Manhattan Center crossover. 
with the WWE in February of 97. Um, he approached me about doing some songs for that based on the songs that the guys were using. And somehow or another, I had a 24 hour time limit because of schedules. He contacted me on a Thursday. He needed them by Monday. So I started making phone calls as soon as I figured out exactly what it was he needed. Because when he described it to me, he said, you know how on, on Nitro, Chris Jericho comes out to Soundgarden, but it's not Soundgarden. And I'm like, I have no idea. I've never seen it. He goes, what about when Diamond Dallas Page comes out to Nirvana, but it's not Nirvana? I'm like, I still don't know what you're talking about. I went and bought a bunch of wrestling CDs, listened to them, thought the music was garbage. But then he, he, I asked, mm -hmm. is this what you want? He goes, yeah, but just not garbage. So I based those songs off the songs that the guys were using. And because of scheduling, I only had 24 hours, you know, to put this whole thing together. And on a, I believe it was Saturday morning at like 9 a.m., I went into the Palace Studio in Westchester, which was run by a dude named Eddie Wall, who has since won like 10,000 Emmy Awards, and he's produced El Nino and Primer 55. But back then, Eddie Wall's studio was not in Hollywood. It was in the basement or the garage of his parents' house in Westchester. And the musicians I found, I lucked out. I got Steve Budgie Werner and uh, Richie Scarlett from the Ace Freely Band to play on those tracks. And I got this other dude, Andy Abeen. And we all went into the studio. I went in at 9.30, but the rest of them showed up at 10. And we worked continuously into the wee hours of the morning and around nine o'clock the next day, I finally got home with, I think it was like three or four mediocrely recorded kind of okay mixed songs. But, you know, they got played at the Manhattan Center that Monday and I thought, oh, I was over and done with. Little did I know that Taz would want me to, he wanted to keep using his version of that song. So I had to redo it because the original had a few bad spots some bad notes, but there was no time to fix things. And it just kind of kept going from there. Now, a lot of fans really uh, look back fondly in, in terms of the original ECW for that, that uh, this is extreme iconic track how how did you come up with that particular uh piece and what what was did you have any idea when i guess this is more a, an overall question but did you have any idea when you when you were coming up with these with these tracks how you know we'd, we'd be sitting here you know 25 30 years later and still talking about them not a shot no 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 i i thought this was going to be a a uh, 15 minute thing, to be honest with you. Like after the Manhattan Center, I at the time, I, I, I'm, I've i always been reclusive when it comes to music. Like I'll have a project and I'll keep it going for a few years and then I'll walk away for a few years and then I'll go back to it. And, you know, I'll, then I'll, I'll leave and I'll do something out. That's been my MO since I first picked up a guitar. I'll, I'll make music for, for 16 months, then I'll do graphics for 32 months and then go back to music for five years and you know, so on and so forth. So at the time I was retired, I was out of music. I had broken up the original version of the Slash Tones. I had a regular gig. I was working in a real, real job that I'm not allowed to mention by law. And regarding the ECW theme, by that point I had created the music for Taz that he had started using because of backstage politics with Perry Saturn and Taz both running the ECW school. If Taz had his own music, then Perry had to have his own music. So I started working on that. And once again, like three or four days before the barely legal pay-per-view, Paul told me he needed music to open the show. And once again, I had to explain to Mr. Heyman that a three minute song takes a lot longer than three minutes to record. And his ability to not only not take no for an answer, but convince you that you want to do this. You know, he convinced me that I wanted to stay up for four straight days, working it from two o'clock in the morning to six o'clock in the morning and, 
and working in a studio where hookers were walking up and down outside because our budget was next to nothing. And he convinced me that I really wanted to do it. I drank the Kool-Aid and I did it. And uh, as far as the song itself with Paul, I would always say, give me an example of five different songs and what you like about them and why you'd want to use them. And I took his, his thing, but the inspiration behind the ECW thing was to try and create something like the theme from Jaws, something that would build slowly, but sound very, very menacing from the very first note on. And that's what me and Roderick Cohn did over a four day period as we were tweaking and mastering the Eliminators music. And I think I was doing something for great Sasuke and I, some other tune that, that he had me prep like a generic something. I, I forget that's, that that's been lost to history, but I had four days. I wish I had five, but the fifth day was the Terry Funk banquet. And I, I was told that I had to be there and I'm very glad, very happy that I actually did go to that, but I wouldn't have minded that extra day in the studio. Again, he only called me up like Tuesday and said, can you do this by Sunday? So, when they, I heard it for the first time in the arena that night, I'm like, wow, this doesn't suck. You know, this actually ain't bad. And they used it for the pay-per-view, and I figured that was it. It was over and done with. But then he changed the opening of the syndicated television show, Hardcore TV, where he was using, um, I think, Thunder Kiss 65 was the old theme song or something. And he switched it to the theme song that I did for the pay-per-view. And I only thought it would be done for the pay-per-view. At one point, I suggested that they start their live shows with that because the live shows would always end with Ms. Mr. Lou, the Dick Dale song. You know, that he would do on TV, he would do the Pulp Fiction montage over the Dick Dale tune. But at the live events, they would end the show with Mr. Lou as well. So I said, why don't you just start it with, you know, start the show with the thing I did for the pay-per-view. And he took that and decided to also start the TV show with that. And that's how that came about. Wow, that's, um, that's, that's extremely interesting, the way that things just sort of uh, fall together based on uh, happenstance. In, in, when you were creating uh, the music for, and we'll get into some of the specifics, of course, of the great uh, classic themes that, that you did for the ECW wrestlers, how uh, you mentioned uh, Perry wanted, Perry Saturn wanted his, and, and you did uh, Taz's, et cetera. Did your creative process, did that involve uh, getting getting to know the wrestler and getting their input or, or, or how, walk us through that process, please. Okay, um, Taz was using a Kiss tune, War Machine. I didn't talk to him before I did the Manhattan Center version, which was not really War Machine. It was the changed just enough to avoid litigation version of, of War Machine, which has been done by WWF, WWE, AEW is doing it now, TNA does it. That's, that seems to be the recurring theme of wrestlers is steal the idea, but change it just enough so you can't be sued. And that was Taz's first song. And Perry Saturn came about. And I'll give you the backstory of that. I get a phone call from Paul Heyman saying, can you do me a favor? I'm like, oh, fuck, here we go again. And he's like, he explains the whole politics behind the House of Hardcore School, that if Taz has original music, Perry wants original music too. Can you go come out to the show? We have a house show in Long Island, which wasn't far from my house, and talk to Perry to see what he needs. And I go there and I had the strangest meeting I've ever had with anybody regarding music where I sat at a table with Taz dressed, you know, in his sweats and a fully naked Perry Saturn. Saturn was one of the, the couple of guys, there were a couple of guys that used to walk around the locker room naked. I'm a new, I'm a new person to wrestling. So who am I to say what's normal and, and strange in that universe? I had no prior experience in wrestling locker rooms before Heyman brought me into ECW. So I'm learning something new every day. The first time I heard somebody talking carny, I thought they were having a stroke. 
you know, with the, the you know, Giazimi, the Azat. I'm, I'm sitting there going, the guy's having a stroke. Either that or I got so high with Van Damme, I forgot how to understand English. So anyhow, I'm sitting there with a naked Perry Saturn, and I'm not putting it over. I'm not even mentioning anything. And we're talking about ideas for his song. And finally, Taz speaks up. He goes, brother, put your fucking pants on. You're sitting here talking about music with your Schwanson hanging out. Put your fucking pants on. But he just put a towel on. Anyhow, so we talked about what he wanted. He wanted something robotic, mechanical, apocalyptical. They were using some remix of a white zombie tune at the time, but we kind of ignored that. And that's how we came up with Total Elimination, which was the second one. And then it was the Paul Heyman phone call needing stuff for the pay-per-view, including mastering the, the Eliminators music, creating the ECW theme, creating something for Sasuke, something for somebody else. And that was where the four days uh, leading into the pay-per-view. Now, you had asked me a question, but I only got three hours sleep last night because I'm working on a Christmas project. So I totally forgot where the fuck this thing was supposed to go and what I was supposed to say. No, I, I, I think you I think you actually hit it. A fan here is uh, commenting on the fact that Hookah Blues is, is still his favorite wrestling theme ever. Respect, of course, for Sabu. Wanted, wanted to that that one there really stands out, of course, along with Taz and, and so many others. But wanted to, to ask you how you came up with that and whether or not you're you're amazed at uh, one of the questions that i had down farther in my list was has there ever been a, a theme that companies have replicated so many times and i'm just wondering if if you when when sabu was on aw tv this year if you had any sort of um uh, <laughs> contact with that or any compensation <laughs> no dude I didn't know that was happening until I heard it, and I thought it was good. I just thought that the kid that's doing the music should have just given it a different title instead of Return to the Hookah. And I I, I said some star sarcastic shit on the internet to make myself laugh, and websites picked it up like I was serious, like I was demanding a fucking T-shirt from Tony Khan. You know, how can I be pissed off at somebody else doing to me what I did to other people? It's part of the business. The whole thing with Hookah Blues was never created for pro wrestling. Let me backtrack this. It was an idea I had for a song, you know, based on the plotting drums of several other songs, including China White by the Scorpions. And I always loved Godzilla. And there was one song from the Godzilla movie, uh, Destroy All Monsters, a tune called March of the Monsters, that I always liked. And I wanted to do something similar to that. So myself, Rod Cohn, and I believe Gary Sullivan, who played drums on that, we came up with, with the basic backing tracks. Arno Hecht was coming in to basically just double the guitars, you know, reinforce the guitars. Arno's, Arno Hecht is, has worked with Joan Jett and, you know, James Brown and the Rolling Stones and Dion and Robert Plant, you know, little bands. You, you may have heard of them. You know, so Arno, who I've been working with since 94, he came in just to double the guitars. But while he was warming up, he was playing these weird Middle Eastern licks. And I'm like, the, the light bulb went off. And I'm like, stop. I took away the, the sheet music, the, the chart I had from him. I'm like, ignore all this. Do what you just did. And I didn't give him musical directions. I remember exactly what I told him because he's a Star Trek fan. You're on a faraway planet. And on the other side is a blue-skinned, three-breasted, most beautiful belly dancer in the world. And you want her to come dance for you, but she doesn't understand English. She understands saxophone. Make her come over here to you and service you with your saxophone. And that was his inspiration. And he went into that crazy snake charmer, you know, magic carpet, uh, sexy you know, intertwining and yet still menacing saxophone line. And that's how the song was created. It was never created for Sabu, much like how Enter Sandman was not created for Sandman. But because of those facts that those songs were not created particularly for a wrestler, but became synonymous with the wrestler is what's cool. 
You know, mm-hmm. when, when I first sent it to Paul to listen to amongst other songs that I had created, you know, either for the company, that was the same time period I created Taz's second theme, Survive If I Let You. So we recorded Hookah Blues at the same time with no idea that it was going to be used. I said, hey, check this out. I came up with a trippy tune. You know, the same thing happened with Tajiri's music, which I actually had recorded like five years before ECW existed. You know, where I sent it on a CD. Hey, check this out. If you like it, maybe you could use it. So when, when they first heard it, they weren't really sure who to assign Hookah Blues to. I know that the Dudleys wanted it. At one point, they were talking about Shane Douglas possibly using it because it had like that that whole sexy sex music vibe thing going on. And they and all of a sudden, whoever, I think it was Paul, came up with the idea. No, it's got like the, the Arabic Middle Eastern thing. It, it sounds like Sabu. At first, Sabu hated it. He thought it was too slow because at the time he was coming out to Little Crazy by Fight, which is a far more up-tempo tune, you know. But he ended up really liking the tune because he with with Little Crazy, you had to come out to the ring and not like with with Hookah Blues, he could take his sweet ass. Now he could stop and roll a joint before he gets to the ring, you know. So <laughs> he he didn't have to run out there and be insane psycho crazy from the moment he went through the curtain. And it worked for him so well that it was copied in, in TNA when he was there. They did a great job with their version, Carpet Ride. And, and AEW did a really, really almost spot on version with, with their version of it. So I'm, I'm flattered. You know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, with, I wanted to ask you about uh, Tommy Dreamer's uh, music. Obviously, that's, you know, a close, um, there's a close relationship to the Allison Chains. Yeah, we all uh, did that. Yeah. Was that, in terms of the creative process there, was, was that difficult in a way to try and, and, and mimic that, if you will, rather than a, a, a totally original composition? Or, or what challenges did you find trying to capture the spirit of, like, Man in the Box for for his particular uh, music? Well, Tommy used both. And since then, when he was in WWE, I believe it was Jim Johnson, he did his version of Man in the Box. And then Impact Wrestling did their version of Man in the Box. And there's like four or five different variations of that same tune that each company did. The challenge is to make it sound like the original without being the original. You know, I I forget what the, I I don't do that music anymore, but I think it's as long as it's only three out of four bars are the same and the fourth bar changes, it's a derivative. I forget how that works, but we had a guideline to work with. There's also certain Alice in Chains trademarks, like the turnaround at the end of a verse that we didn't do. We did something different. They, they did that, you know, that, that, that trilly, whatever thing. And we just went, bomb, 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 you know, just did, you know, stabs. So you still had the basic vibe of Alice in Chains without it being Alice in Chains. Mm-hmm. When, when you started uh, integrating or, or being integrated into and you started hanging around uh or, or being involved in in shows and that sort of thing did did you the the more you you absorbed the backstage atmosphere of ecw did that assist you in your your work per se yeah yeah being able to understand what was in these guys heads and how they approached what they were going to do at one point i realized that You know, my preconceived notion of what wrestling was had nothing to do with what wrestling actually is. That it is a, how do I describe it? It's a choreographed, scripted stunt show with episodic male soap opera themes underlined within the characters, the product, and the match. And when you take into consideration that you're not trying to do music for a like for Muhammad Ali or for Mike Tyson or for for Frank Mir or for a UFC guy when you're trying to basically showcase the theatrical aspect of a particular character 
it gives you a different mindset for how you would approach certain pieces of music. In in your experience back there uh, in in the backstage environment, I, I I in my research learned that you had a couple of notable uh, sort of uh, experiences. One being the the encounter, the physical encounter between Junkyard Dog and New Jack. I was wondering if you could let the fans uh, know about that one. I'll talk about it because both have unfortunately passed away. The story that New Jack told me is at one point, JYD bought cocaine off of New Jack. And what he gave for payment was a check that he cut out of a magazine that was part of an advertisement. It wasn't a real check. And Jack tried to cash it, you know, not paying attention that there was probably like a shampoo commercial on the, you know, advertisement on the back of the check. It's just something Dog found in a magazine. He clipped it out. He gave Jack a fake check. Jack tried to cash it. Jack almost got arrested. Jack was pissed. The first time they see each other in, in, I think it was, that was the Cobb County or the Atlanta pay-per-view, wherever that was. And uh, Sylvester's really happy to see Jack. He's, hey, man, how are you? And then Jack's, you motherfucker, and just starts swinging. And I was always told, never get involved when two wrestlers are fighting. Let them do what they got to do. So me and a bunch of others are just watching them fight. And Paul Heyman finally jumped in, horse collared New Jack, pulled him away. And even though New Jack had hit him and he bit through Junkyard Dog's, Junkyard Dog uh, had bit through his cheek. That's why when he came out, he had like a little tissue paper, like he cut himself shaving. From what I understand, Junkyard Dog was not one to be messed with that he was a very tough guy. And if he wasn't a guest there getting a payday, he probably would have got one full out with New Jack. And I was told just never to get involved. So I didn't step in, but yeah, I did see the fight. And in terms of uh, the, the, the Bam Bam Bigelow dark side of the ring, it, it covered the incident between him and the fan. And I understand you witnessed that one too. More than witnessed, I had to go out and bring the fan backstage. Wow. Could could you uh, set the scene for that? Uh, for yeah, our Bam, Bam, Bigelow, Bam Bam Bigelow, a guy who could have broken me in half by sneezing, said, go get this motherfucker. So I go out with his son, Shane, and we're walking around the, I think it was the sportsplex in Staten Island, until Shane pointed out the guy. I said, you leave, you go backstage, you go hide. And then me and my, my uh, another dude that, that I, my writing partner that I did a lot of the covert shit for ECW with Craig Hasbrook, we go and tell the guy, hey, can you come with us? Bam Bam Bigelow would like to meet you. The guy's face lit up from ear to, you know, the big, oh my God, I'm gonna get to meet Bam Bam Bigelow. Little did he know what he was into. That first punch from Bigelow sent them flying back between me and Haz. We're standing there, and there's a body just flies by us. And there were a bunch of younger guys at the front door that were about to run out and do a spot. And I look at all of them, and I said, everybody look at your shoes. Do not look at what's going on, because the less you see, the less you can testify about. Look mm -hmm. at your shoes. And then Bam Bam beat the living snot out of this guy. And then we left it to Atlas Security to, to get him out of the building, sneak him out of the building. And I this was this was a fan that punched his son, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, wow. and I saw I saw Shane right after he happened. He had the welt started growing on his head. You know, you could see that it was a fist. Unbelievable. That uh, th that I, I bet you that fan never uh, touched uh, anyone Ooh, in, no. uh, in the crowd. I dude, I. I if that fan is watching now, oh, sorry, dude, you know, <laughs> karma. Exactly. Fan is asking when uh, WWE bought ECW, did they immediately get all the rights to your ECW music? I think I know this one, but. Yeah, that's a question that has some guidelines as to me answering. All I can say is they purchased the rights to the catalog and any disputes that I had with WWE were amicably resolved by both parties. Fair I don't enough. Break my contracts. Fair enough. Time. Absolutely. 
what when when you look at uh, what a big part of you know the golden era era as we like to say of uh, wrestling in the eighties and the nineties that the theme music was and we're talking about uh, you know Jim Johnson's work as well. Do you do you understand why that seems to have uh, largely um, you know gone by the wayside and they're and they're going with with some exceptions Tony Khan buying the rights to say uh cm punk's music uh living color blah 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 but well, actually no no cm punk has licensed from living color his right to use that song anywhere he goes F fair enough correct but as far as i need to backtrack you for me wrestling started in the 70s when i was watching bruno san martino there was no music mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the 80s when the wrestling boom happened wrestling had gone off broadcast television in and I lived in a part of New York, in Queens, New York. I still live in Queens. We were the last borough to get cable. So other than Saturday night's main event once a month, I had no access to pro wrestling. By that point, Bruno San Martino had permed his hair. He had put on a yellow jacket. And he was sitting next to Vince McMahon doing the Antonino Rocker roll. He was doing commentary. So for me, wrestling was over. I had seen some Bob Backlund matches. I saw Bob Backlund at the Garden a couple of times. I saw Superstar at the Garden when he was champion. I saw Bruno at the Garden when he was champion. You know, I even saw the infamous, not infamous, the famous Dusty Rhodes, Superstar Graham first match where they handed Dusty the title after it was a countout victory. I was there for that. You know, I saw a bunch of Backlund matches, but then I could no longer watch wrestling. It wasn't on Channel 9. It wasn't on Channel 47 here in New York, and I didn't have cable. I didn't know Backlund had lost to The Sheik until after the fact. I didn't know that Hogan had beat The Sheik until after the fact. All of that was after the fact because I had no access to it. I think the last WWF show or WWF show I'd actually seen was I believe it was um, Bob Backlund defending the belt against Mr. Fuji or Toru Tanaka, you know, something like that. I'd have to go through my archives. But wrestling was so off my radar so that the rock and wrestling thing that happened, I would only get to see it on broadcast television, and I thought it was stupid, to be honest with you. I appreciate it now. But everybody suddenly went from being a real person, like be they a Dominic DiNucci, a Davey O'Hanlon, a Kevin Sullivan, to being um, the, 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 the dumpster guy, the Duke the dumpster, and, and, and Bobby the brain, and, and Billy the, the, the bookie, and, and Harry the horse. You know, everything became mm -hmm. a cartoon character. And I'm like, this isn't the shit I used to watch. So it didn't really, I, I paid no attention to it until I met some dude at the China Club named Paul Heyman, and then a couple of years later, he made me go to a wrestling show. And then since then, I have caught up, you know, through retroactive history and, and videotapes on all the shit I missed. I, I, I missed some good stuff, you know. Looking back at it now, what I thought was really campy and cartoony was actually pretty cool. Mm -hmm. You know, do, your do, question was regarding music. Well, j just... When when growing up, part of the uh, you know the emotion, the excitement of the product, you know in the WWF uh, especially was you know Jim Johnson's compositions, the 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 emphasis on entrance music, and I guess to a degree it was still relatively new at that time. But it seems modern wrestling uh, goes more uh, in terms of generic uh, compositions, if you will. Do, do you do you think that the the product has suffered by lack of yourself or a Jim Johnson um, putting those those uh, tunes to the forefront? Nobody went to see The Undertaker because of what Jim Johnson wrote. Nobody went to see Sabu because of what I wrote. You know, let's not overinflate our own egos. Yeah, I'd love to say wrestling music sucks since I'm not doing it, but music is just part of the background. You know, it's part of the presentation. If I didn't do hookah blues and he still was coming out to to Little Crazy by fight, Sabu would still be the iconic un unsung legend that he is. You know, mm -hmm. 
a lot of the people that made wrestling music try and, and overinflate their egos like they're doing the greatest thing since sliced bread. Yeah, we're Mozart and Montavani combined as long as Mozart and Montavani was ripping off Led Zeppelin. You know? But would, wouldn't you say that Hulk Hogan wouldn't be the same without Real American? I know he was coming out to Eye of the Tiger and that was wonderful and everything, but really, can you separate Hulk Hogan from Real American? No, because like much like Enter Sandman and Hookah Blues and so on and so forth, certain characters, their theme music became part of the presentation. Ultimate mm -hmm. Warrior comes to mind. Okay, what was basically a knockoff of Good Times, Bad Times by Led Zeppelin became synonymous with his character as synonymous as the makeup. Hulk Hogan with Rick Derringer's Real American. Yeah, great. But what about when he was coming out to Voodoo Child by Jimi Hendrix? He was still over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Sabu on some indie shows, when they didn't have hookah blues, he'd tell them to play Like a Virgin by Madonna. You know, and just 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 to mess with the audience, they didn't know who was coming out, and it was just proof that it's like the song didn't make me; I made the song, and I always agreed with him on that. There was one indie show that I went to see Sabu at. The DJ didn't didn't have anything, and he's like, "What should I use?" And I said, "How about Send in the Clowns by, by um, oh fuck, what was the singer? I forget the the old singer that wasn't Neil Diamond. Whoever sang sang in the Clowns, someone in the chat room will remind us." But I suggested that the DJ didn't have that. So I said, what about Madonna? They are, which one? Anyone. You know, you know, come out to Gloria Gaynor. I will survive something stupid. And he did. And he was over. You know, the audience is sitting there scratching their head as they're hearing like a virgin. And then Sabu comes through the curtain and he gets the pop. The only difference is he didn't get the pop at the start of the music. Mm hmm. I, I think I think you could get a, a lot of um, counter uh, counter opinions to that um, based on you know fan fan response seems to be or it seemed to be much greater with with the distinctive music rather than the generic stuff. But that that that's probably a debate that could, that could go on for a while. Uh, yeah. But. but I, it's hard to imagine some of the, you know, the classics without, for example, Sandman. Enter Sandman, huge part of, of his ECW uh, persona. And then when he went to WWE, he had that, that generic stuff and people to this day still complain about that. Yeah, well, that's a licensing issue and a cost issue. They went for the money for the one night stand pay-per-view to use it, but... Their whole thing was being able to rebroadcast footage. So mm -hmm. they used it for the one night stand, but then they overdubbed their generic version of Enter Sandman. The whole thing before Enter Sandman, he was using Hit Me With Your Best Shot by Pat Benatar. And then at one point early on, when he was still a surfer, he was coming out to Surfing USA by the Beach Boys. Enter Sandman became part of the presentation for the night. And somebody said this to me recently, you may not remember a single good Sandman match, but you can remember a lot of great Sandman intros because the whole part of his presentation, most of it was the intro, getting to the ring, going to different spots. He timed his opening of the beer, the raising of the cane, you know, going to different parts of the audience in conjunction with parts of the song. So he made his entrance very theatrical based around that song. And to this day, he can go to any indie on the planet and do his entrance, go in the ring, hit the guy with a kendo stick, pin him in 10 seconds and still be over because the fans want to sing the song. They want to get beer splashed on him. They want to see him smash the beer can in his hand, raise the stick. That's part of the presentation, man. And it's great because he can keep doing that entrance into his 90s. Mm -hmm. He might have to use a walker by then or they may have to real, you know, <laughs> roll him out to the ring in a wheelchair, but he could still open the beer in the right spot and raise the stick in the right spot. Yeah, absolutely. In with, with any of the, the, the theme music that you created, was there ever an instance where um, you, you came up with a, with a product and uh, the wrestler shot it down or, or their, their ideas really influenced the, the end result? 
Uh, the closest with that would have been Taz's second theme, which had 27 different versions. He wanted wow. to change his character, um, but he still wanted it to sound like his first theme song, which sounded like his previous theme song. And ta at the time, Prodigy was the number one band on the planet. Okay, and I think there was another techno band, I'm forgetting the name, that was really big around that time, Fat Boy Slim, Root Boy Slim, something like that. And you had um, Chumbawamba had some, you know, they, the, all these bands had, had like these weird vibes, and he was listening to that kind of music. So the first attempt was a techno version that I shot down. I'm like, dude, this is embarrassing. You know, he wanted it to be, to be darker and grittier character for that part of his career. After he lost the belt to Bam Bam Bigelow, he wanted to be meaner. He slightly changed his gear so that it was an all black singlet and just the, the orange letters on the back instead of the orange straps. And he changed a lot of his persona, his entrance, his approach, his, his promos, and he wanted the music to reflect that. But we went through so many different versions. At one point I had a version that kind of sounded like Jane's Addiction and then, you know, keeping the riff and then changing this. And then it became a political thing, which became a thorn in my side. Paul didn't want to change the music. He wanted Taz to keep using his music. And it also became an internal struggle between them where Paul was trying to sabotage it because he didn't want Taz to be, seem like he can get everything he wants. You know, it was a way of kind of reeling in the ego and what have you. And, but at one point, you know, I, I did one version that we played at the arena and it bombed because it had all these techno sounds and disco sounds and ecstasy laden, you know, sound effects and all that shit going on. Taz actually came into the studio when we finally did that version and it bombed. It sounded like shit. So I'm like sitting there, you know, with my head down. I'm like, well, they can't all be winners. You know, you can't hit a home run every time. And I, I said to Paul, dude, I've spent so much time on it. Let me go back in, clean this up, remix it and do it my way. And he's like, OK. So a couple of days later, I meet up with him. I play a cassette for him in the car and he's just giving me this dirty look. You know, he goes, I'm pissed off at you. I'm like, why? It's like. Now I can't say no to Taz. This is too good. Now I have to use it. You know, the version Taz wanted, it was a pile of horseshit. My version, what ended up becoming Survive If I Let You, Heyman said, I can't say no to you. This is actually cool. And that was the closest to, to what you discussed. A lot of the guys really didn't even hear their music until it was done. Mike Lawson heard his tune the night it was finished. Tajiri heard his tune when they played it as he was going through the curtain. And as I mentioned earlier, that's a song that I created with Roderick Cohn back in like 91 or 90 before ECW ever existed. We, we would spend all, stay out all night partying, go to the after hours, and then at like five in the morning, go back to his apartment. He would turn on his equipment and I would just create weird shit. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, uh, kind of, kind of a, a deep cut. But aside from uh, the "This Is Extreme," Mike Awesome's music was uh, was uh, probably probably my my favorite. How how did you uh, come up with that one? That that uh, totally encapsulated that character. Would would you not say? That was a collaboration with me and a band out of Long Island named Reckless Fortune, who were good friends of mine. And unfortunately, the lead vocalist, Frankie Fortune, who sang on that song, passed away a few years ago. Mm. Paul, I, I was, it was on Thanksgiving weekend, and, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is getting really dry. Give me a moment to take my cough no medicine. NyQuil. Big N, little Y, big fucking Q. <laughs> Good stuff. So I went out to Long Island to see Reckless Fortune do a show, and Paul came with me. And he really liked the band. And I brought him out there initially to hear the music. They, they had a song called That Is Why, which I thought would have been perfect for Dusty Rhodes and ECW. It 
wasn't a knockoff of anything he did before, but it it fit the Dusty Rhodes, you know, Dusty Rhodes' personality and character. On the way home, he's like, if you write it and, and produce it with these guys, I'll let them do a song for Mike Awesome. So at their next rehearsal, I went to their next rehearsal and we batted out ideas and one guy came up with the riff and we came up with the rhythm and me and Frankie wrote the words and we ended up producing that, you know, with, with his entire band at the time, um, which included Adolf Marcelino on bass, Frank Sinuto on drums, Davey Doom on guitar, Joey Fortune on guitar, and Frank Fortune lead vocals. And I brought in Joe Lynn Turner, the former lead singer of Rainbow and Deep Purple, to do backing vocals on that. He, he, Joe is a good, is still is a good friend of mine. So I'm like, dude, can you come in? Let's make this sound pretty. Hmm. And that's how that tune was created. Oh, there was one other dude, a guy named Steve Bondi, also played guitar on that. We were working out of his studio at the time. Yeah, still, uh, still one of those timeless tracks. Jake Walker, who set up our, our discussion tonight, who, who is a, a huge video game guy, wanted to ask about your uh, involvement and appearance as a playable character in the acclaimed ECW video game that uh, those those of us remember fondly i have the distinction of being a playable character in one of the worst video games of all time and i'm very proud of that <laughs> because in the grand list of things you got donkey kong you got miss pac-man you got harry slash i'm on the list with those two how can i go wrong <laughs> <coughs> sorry coughing laughing and choking at the same time <laughs> Um, Acclaim put everybody in the game, which is why I agreed to appear on it. I didn't want to be in it. I didn't think anybody should be playing wrestling. And Balls Mahoney convinced me to do it. He goes, they're putting the lighting guy in there. Just do it. Have fun. So I went out to Acclaim Entertainment in Long Island. They took my photos. They had me record all that stupid shit I said. And I went out of my way to be goofy and funny. I didn't want to sound like a serious wrestler because I, I wasn't. But when it came time to pick, pick my moves, because I had played the game on N64 when it was a WWE game, it was the same game engine. I was familiar with the mechanics of the game engine. And from my moves, I chose the most difficult moves to counter. And I, from what I was told, I was one of the hardest characters to beat in the game. Allegedly, my finish is the heart punch, like Stan Stasiak and tribute to Stan Stasiak. But having to push 37 buttons at a certain point to do a finish, I never saw myself do a heart punch. So if anybody out there can like somehow get the video footage of my finish from the um, Hardcore Revolution, I'd like to see it for once after 20 plus years of the thing being out. What was with the uh, the pipe uh, gimmick, too? It was smoking pot. But you a, know, a I, regular pipe. Yeah, but they, they wouldn't let me use a hookah. I wanted to use the giant water pipes, but they agreed to the Sherlock home pipe. And then I stop and I'm coughing, I'm choking on the pot. I said, if I'm going to do this, it has to be goofy as fuck. You know, I'm not going to try and portray myself as a serious wrestler. I wasn't even close to being a serious wrestler or any kind of a wrestler. So I did the, the stupidest shit I could think of. And they, they said, fine, they were happy with that. Well, if if any of the fans watching right now can can locate that finisher, please send it and we'll, uh, we'll forward it on to Harry. I, I bet Jake would be able to, to do that. In, in the, the, your time frame in ECW, did you have any moments in ring or uh, promo wise or otherwise that stick out to you the most looking back in retrospect my own personally or, or of the companies itself just just your both your your own personal memories plus what you uh look back fondly for the company the one that jumps out is the one where they had me chasing after spike dudley as he was trying to find rhino and the only direction paul said is don't let the door open you know, you know, the motive, Rhino was allegedly holding the door closed. So we were banging on the door. I was trying to literally break the doorknob off. And all of a sudden I step back for a moment and Paul with two fingers turns, turns the doorknob and it opens right up, making me look like the weakest human being on the planet. 
<laughs> that sticks out because of how stupid it was. As far as individual promos from the wrestlers. The Matches ones, anything. Your favorite ECW moments from the original. Oh, there's just uh, what jumps out. The uh, Hayabusa, Hakushi, Sabu, Van Dam match. Mm-hmm. which I went out of my way to make sure I watched. Um, the chair shot that sent Vito LaGrasso to WCW, where it sold out the dressing room because I think that was a cold spot where Paul basically said, kill this guy. I, I don't know the reasons why. All I know is the entire locker room was out there watching that chair shot. There's hundreds of little moments. If you ask me about a specific something, I'll be able to tell you. But, you know, there, there's this, the, the stairway to hell match where Sam, where Sandman almost fell to the concrete head first. Jumps out at me. Um, Terry Funk's barbed wire match with Sabu jumps out. There's a lot. There was just so much, unfortunately, because all everything I was doing on those shows, I was constantly doing something. So I can't really tell you about a particular show because that entire time basically is jumbled into one giant memory. Mm-hmm. When when uh, things got uh, leaner in the company, did did you have any idea that uh, ECW would be would be closing up, or or was that um, you know somewhat a surprise? I, like- I knew that I knew things were bad, but I also saw firsthand how hard Paul was working to keep the company alive and to try and get us another television deal. There Mm -hmm. was one point he had a meeting scheduled with the USA network. And I went to his house up in Scarsdale to pick him up and take him to the airport. I put his luggage in in the back in the trunk of my car. And then we had time to kill because I got there early. And then he got a phone call. Barry Diller canceled the meeting. Even though he had a flight booked, Barry Diller refused to even take the meeting. So then I spent the next six, eight hours at Paul's house as he called every contact he had in California and every contact that Stonecutter Media had trying to get us just a meeting with another network. His flight had been changed like six times by the late De- Debbie Beaumont. And finally, around seven o'clock at night, he just gave up the ghost. It's like, this is not going to happen today. Excuse me, time for the night roll. Hit her again. So after Paul debuted on on Raw and he was in WWE, was there ever any, because of your close relationship with him, was there ever any uh, talk of you being brought in to offer your services to Titan or not? No, no. What, What would they need me for? They had Jim Johnson. In... With with respect to the WWE ECW though, do you have an opinion on that? And and I, I guess I take it you weren't uh, contacted to be involved in in that either. They already had the rights to my catalog, and I can only describe it as the pet cemetery version of ECW. Mm-hmm. Something like if you've ever seen the pet cemetery, you bring the animal, the pet back from the dead, but it's not quite the same. Mm-hmm. That first episode, the debut episode on sci-fi, was 60 minutes of me being absolutely embarrassed to have anything to do with that. While it Mm -hmm. would have been a good show had it not been called ECW because it gave a platform for CM Punk and Matt Cardona and others to like rise up the ranks, it had nothing to do with ECW. It was just some, some ECW guys. It would be like Paul and Ringo putting the Beatles back together with with Dave Grohl and, 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 you know, Jimmy Page, it's not the Beatles. It's a completely different band. So don't call it the Beatles. Are you of the view that uh, some have actually many have of, of the ECW originals that I've had the uh, fortunate circumstance to interview that uh, it was uh, designed to kill the, the fans love for the original surprise me. You know, Vince, it's notoriously known that Vince cannot get behind something he created. You know, I mean, he can't get behind anything that he didn't create. And he was really annoyed that 
fans were chanting ECW at WWF shows from way before ECW went under. Could it have been purposely made to suck? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. You know, at first it, it was a self-contained company that did, you know, independent shows. Um, and then it became part of the SmackDown show that, where they would tape before or after SmackDown or something like that. And then it just kept getting worse and worse. Towards the end, I hadn't watched, but they had some great wrestlers on there and it would have made a great third show, but it was not ECW. Mm -hmm. You know, me personally, the way I see things, the last ECW tag team champions were Danny Doring and Roadkill, and the last uh, TV champion and world champion was Rhino, and I give Van Damme all the credit in the world for holding the same belt whose lineage goes back to Bruno San Martino, absolutely, but the ECW belt he was given, its lineage does not go back, in my opinion. It's the WWECW version of, of a defunct company. You know, right. if, if Vince decides to, to restart, here, here's the main thing. No matter what had happened to ECW, there's no way Vince McMahon would have ever been champion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're going to include Vince McMahon in the lineup of that title, in the lineage of that title, then it's not, a, it's not the same title that Jimmy Snuka and Don Morocco and Sandman and Shane Douglas and Sabu and Terry Funk and Raven held. It's a different title. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember being amongst many uh, original ECW fans at the time and being totally uh, outraged at that. But I think that was the that was the point in, in yeah. hindsight. Could have been. We've, right. Sorry, go ahead. Could have been. Could have been the reason why they did it. We we touched on this uh, at the start of our our discussion, and and uh, we're just about through our time, but. I, I wanted to know if you look look back all these years later and and see the the uh, appreciation and uh, love that 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 fans still have for your music and uh, your involvement in the company and uh, ever at the time gave it uh, you know such such thought that 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 you would be creating really timeless classic uh, music. Dude, it boggles my mind that people still talk about it, that still remember it, and that still have a fondness for it. I've met a lot of good people I've become friends with because of ECW after ECW ended. Um, sorry, I'm getting messages on Messenger people asking me to link them. Dude, enough. Okay. Um, so I'm... I'm mind boggled that people still talk about it a quarter century later. Absolutely. Did I know at the time it would last this long? Oh, hell no. I thought it was going to be a cup of coffee and over with. Mm. I never would have expected to be talking to you about it 25 years later, let alone anybody else. I never would have expected people to be doing covers of what I did and knockoffs of what I did musically. So it's all good. And before we go, I do have something to talk about coming up. So whenever you're ready to let me plug something, let me know. Well, I was, I was just going to interject there and ask where fans can find you on social media and what plugs you have for current projects. Okay. On every social media, I'm either on as Harry slash slash tones one on Instagram, Harry underscore slash, on Twitter X, Harry Slash on Facebook. If you know my real name, I have another Facebook page that most people seem to find real easily. Um, and what I got coming out is the most absurd project I've approached myself and some other very eccentric musicians I've worked with for years and a few new faces are working on some songs for Christmas. But they're not your typical Christmas songs. I approached the project by ignoring anything that had ever been recorded on certain tunes and just found sheet music and built the songs based around the 18th century, the, eight, the melody that was written in the 19th century. They're all from the 1800s. So Harry Slash and the Slash Tones will be releasing three songs streaming, hopefully before New Year's so they can still be Christmas songs, but this project's gotten delayed a few times. Um, I'm working with some great musicians. I've got even Stephen Levy, who is co-producing it and playing bass with him with, on, on the project. He also played bass on 
Super Crazy song and Rick Rude song and I forget what else. And Les Warner, who was playing drums, he's out in Las Vegas. I'd worked with Les before ECW in the early 90s when, when the band was just the local New York thing. And Les has been recording his drums in Vegas. I got even Steven, like I mentioned, I've got Tom Jack, who I've known for a million years, I'm finally getting to work with him, even though he lives in California. So this digital age of remote recording is really working to my benefit. Um, brought in another dude that I've known since the beginning of time named Russ Byron. He contributed a guitar track for us. And then once those are all set and done, the tracks go out to California for Tony Morabito, who used to be known as Tony Moore in the band Riot. Um, he's going to sing on it. Then they come back to New York for saxophone, which would be Arno Hecht. So it's like a member of Riot, a member of the cult. Tom Jack had a band named Jacks. Even Steven is in Rhythm Gorillas, and he was in Brad Factor 10. And uh, Arno Hecht is, like I said earlier, he's played with some small bands you may have heard of, like the Rolling Stones, the Uptown Horns, Robert Plant, James Brown, Buster Poindexter, Dion. It would be easier to list the bands Arno hasn't worked with. So we're trying to finish up, which is why I look really stoned, but I only got a few hours sleep. I've been working on these almost like they're Paul Heyman calling me up. Hey, it's December 24th. Can you do Christmas music? <laughs> So I, I, I've been working night, night after night, day after day, trying to get these things solidified. But, you know, a three minute song takes a wee bit longer than three minutes to record. But hopefully it'll be on every streaming platform known to man and a few that haven't been invented yet. Very shortly within the next two weeks, hopefully before New Year's, at least a week before Christmas. And if people like them, great. For me, it was just a challenge a musical challenge to attempt a project like this with three people on the West Coast and three people on the East Coast and using, you know, remote recording and, and the latest technology. It's just to see if, if the old guys can compete with the younger guys using them newfangled gadgets that they've done been invented in the last 20 years. Well, we'll definitely look forward to that. Keep in, keep in touch and we will let the fans know when it is promulgated, where to find it. Harry, I want to thank you very much for your time tonight on the Great North Wrestling Podcast. Thank you. Some quick shout-outs. Like I said, shout-out to even Steven, Les Warner, Tom Jack, Ross Byron, Tony Moore, Arno Hecht, my friend Jennifer in, in Florida, who will probably call me in 15 minutes and tell me my hair was out of place or some stupid <laughs> shit like that. A shout out to every slash tone I ever worked with. And a, a big special thank you to my friend who lives in Paris that suggested doing Christmas music, which is kind of odd because Christmas is not my favorite holiday. But it was, like I said, it's a challenge and I got to work on music that was written in the 1800s. Well, we'll definitely we'll definitely stay in touch and look forward to that. But until then, fans, this has been a very special edition of the Great North Wrestling Podcast. I want to thank Harry Slash one more time. And uh, folks, stay tuned to The Hannibal TV. We've got much more content to come. And take care, everybody. Peace.